I'm going to share the screen now with the music. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Iggy, do you hear me? I do. Okay, great. I apologize for the format of the slides, some technical issues. Welcome to the 52nd in a series of uh, monthly sessions. Today on February 23rd, a fantastic session awaits us. Uh, I'll introduce the speakers in a second, but today we're going to talk about the orbit and why neurosurgeons really need to understand and master uh, the orbit. Uh, after our esteemed speakers will finish, uh, we'll have our uh, cerebrovascular and skull base fellows. First, Matthew Sun uh, present a case. And after that, our infolded fellow uh, PGY4, Eva Wu, present an, a second case. Um, of course, all of you are probably have been on these sessions many times. These are some links if you are interested in contacting us here at the University of Miami, or particularly if you're interested in uh, uh, viewing the previously recorded sessions, we have now a treasure of multiple speakers uh, that have given fantastic sessions uh, over, over the last three years. Anytime during the session, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we will address them uh, at the end. Uh, again, I am... Uh, very pleased to uh, have as uh, co-directors, as you know, Carolina Benjamin, my partner, Mike Ivan, and Bobby Stark. Uh, so now for our speakers tonight, I'll introduce them in the order in which they are going to speak. First is Maria Perez-Selva, 
uh, the, who is an associate professor of neurosurgery at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. I don't think Maria needs any introduction to this audience. Not only is she a spectacular, accomplished skull-based surgeon, but of course, a, a Roten a student and has recently opened a fantastic Roten anatomy lab and Mayo Clinic and has fantastic courses and of course has be produced beautiful dissections over the years. She's going to talk to us about the orbital space, a route and a destination for the neurosurgeon, a surgical anatomy roadmap. Next will be Chris Mo. Chris is professor of otolaryngology and uh, at University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, Chris is an absolute pioneer in orbital endoscopic surgery uh, uh, and has focused his attention on that. When I was president of the NASBS several years ago, he was the first one I thought of to, in, to, to encourage to expand the oculoplastic uh, theme within NASBS, and of course, it has taken off since he has uh, put his effort there. And Chris, thank you very much for introducing that field, particularly to us, the neurosurgeons. And last but but not least, Giorgio Zenonos, who is an assistant professor of neurosurgery and co-director of the Center for Cranial Based Surgery and director of the Cranial Nerve Program. A director of clinical operations in Pittsburgh at UPMC in Pennsylvania. Of course, I'm biased. George was one of my spectacular skull-based cerebrovascular fellows a few years ago. And George is going to talk about dancing around the optic nerve. George is Greek, so I'm not sure if it's a Zorba, the Greek dance or not, but we will see uh, indications and limitations within the surgical toolbox. Um, so there we go, enough of me talking. So now, Maria, please share your slides and, and start your presentation. And unmute your microphone. Thank you very much. You hear me okay? Yes. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure uh, to uh, talk here uh, about the orbital space, which is a route and a destination for the neurosurgeon. And I'm going to talk mainly about, uh, you know, the anatomy and how different approaches and different routes, you know, can be used in our surgical toolbox. And this is a uh, superior view where we can see the orbit on the left side. And, and we know that uh, from the superior, uh, from the transcranial standpoint, we can really access very well the roof of the orbit and the lateral aspect of the orbit. And then at the same time, we see here that the nose and paranasal sinuses have opened a new route where we can access um, you know, the other medial and inferior half of the orbit from the endonasal uh, standpoint. So two approaches, complementary and um, really important to know. And we have here, this is the right orbit where uh, we have the orbital rim. This is the supraorbital notch, which is going to be important for our incisions for the supraorbital approaches. And then in the medial aspect, we have the, um, the upper portion of the maxilla and then part of the frontal bone uh, joining here anteriorly. Then we have the lacrimal bone, the lamina papyracea, that is part of the ethmoid bone. The roof of the orbit is mainly formed by the frontal bone. And then we have here a great part of the orbit also formed by the lesser wing and the greater wing of the sphenoid. Here, the maxillary, the upper part of the maxillary sinus, part of the maxilla, and a little bit of the uh, palatine bone also forming the orbit. Then we have also forming the orbital rim, the zygomatic bone. And just to look at the important structures that we are going to review, we have from lateral to medial, the superior orbital fissure that continues with the cavernous sinus, the inferior orbital fissure, the infraorbital groove, and this is the uh, infraorbital canal. And then we have very important, uh, the optic canal right here. And this is the optic strut. 
We have two foramina that are very important, the anterior ethmoidal and the posterior ethmoidal foramen that are uh, really key for some of the approaches. So looking straight at the orbit, again, a uh, great part of it is formed by the uh, greater wing of the sphenoid, lesser wing of the sphenoid, and in between them, the superior orbital fissure. So the approaches to the orbit can be described, divided between the approaches to the orbit itself or the approaches through the orbit to either the cavernous sinus, the frontal lobe, the optic canal, etc. So this is a view of the sphenoid sinus where we can see, uh, this is an anterior view, this is the sphenoid bone and the sphenoid sinus here. So this is the optic nerve in the optic canal. So great part of the optic canal is facing the endonasal surface and the roof is formed by the lesser wing of the sphenoid and the lateral aspect by the optic strut. Then we can see the relationship between the superior orbital fissure. And if we build the skull base from posterior to anterior, we see the uh, sphenoid bone, and this is the ethmoid bone, which is going to dictate our medial approaches. Just to look at another uh, perspective of this anatomy, it's important to know that the, uh, the external part of the orbit is covered by the orbicularis oculi. And very importantly, you know, the branch of the orbicularis, which is about more or less about within the two centimeters uh, behind the uh, external canthus. So we want to make sure that when we perform these incisions uh, in the anterior part of the, um, the septum or the orbit, we are not uh, injuring the facial branch to the orbicularis oculi. So this is another view of the same uh, dissection, the relationship between the facial uh, nerve branches and the orbicularis oculi. And if we dissect it further from lateral to medial, we're going to find the, the orbital ring, the external aspect that continues with the zygomatic arch. And the relationship between the orbit, the temporalis fossa, and the temporal dura is very important as we are going to see. So if we remove the orbital rim and then we drill part of the sphenoid wing, we're going to find the periorbita. And then uh, this periorbita, uh, if we remove the periorbita, we can see from lateral to medial, the lateral rectus muscle, the superior rectus muscle, this is the optic nerve, and this is the inferior rectus muscle. This is the levator palpebra and the lacrimal gland. A gland. This is the lacrimal nerve. So we have a window uh, from lateral to medial between these uh, between these uh, muscles to access the contents of the orbit. So again, if the relationships between this is the orbital apex. This is uh, from lateral to medial. So uh, this is the left side, lacrimal gland, which is the upper external. Uh, corner of the uh, anterior part of the orbit, um, lateral rectus muscle, and then the relationship between the temporal dura, uh, the sphenoid wing that has been partially drilled that will bring us to the anterior clinoid process, and the relationship between the apex of the orbit, the temporal lobe, and this is the temporalis muscle. So this is a very important relationship because if we go back, then uh, in continuation with the superior orbital fissure, we see the cavernous sinus. So this is the third cranial nerve that divides into two inside the orbit, is inside the annulus of Zin. And then uh, we can see, so six, we, uh, six is right here. So we don't see it very well, but it goes to the lateral rectus uh, muscle here. Uh, this is the fourth cranial nerve and V1, which are actually outside the annulus of Zin. So if we look at the periorbita, they are going to be these two nerves, uh, the, you know, the branches from V1 and the fourth cranial nerve are going to be just uh, under the periorbita. So we have to be very careful. And if we uh, transcranially stimulate and we have, we are monitoring for, we consistently will see that at the end of the optic canal, we're gonna find crossing over uh, the apex of the orbit, the fourth and 
the fourth cranial nerve. So this is from inferior, an inferior view of the orbit where we can see. Uh, so this is uh, the right side. So this is medial and this is lateral. And then we can see uh, the medial rectus muscle, the inferior oblique, uh, the inferior rectus muscle. And then we can see the optic nerve right there and the branches of the ophthalmic artery, two of which are going to go through the, poster the posterior and the anterior ethmoidal canals. And this is a, an inferior view of the central retinal artery, which comes as a branch from the ophthalmic artery and goes consistently in the inferior aspect of the optic nerve in its uh, orbital segment. So now switching uh, to the superior aspect, we have uh, here the frontal sinus. This is the ethmoid and the sphenoid sinus. And then we're going to open uh, the roof of the orbit and opening the periorbita. So the first thing that we're going to see is the frontalis, uh, the frontal branch of B1. And then this is the trochlear nerve, the fourth cranial nerve. And then we see that the third cranial nerve goes inside the annulus of sin and divides in two main branches to uh, innervate the rest of the muscles. This, this is the superior ophthalmic vein that also runs uh, here, uh, very important. This is the lacrimal nerve. And we can see that uh, this is the laboratory proper uh, muscle and we see the superior rectus muscle, uh, the superior oblique muscle, and we can see the trochlear nerve innervating uh, the muscle here. So then uh, looking at the superior and inferior uh, aspects of the uh, divisions of the um, third nerve that we can see now again, from lateral to medial, uh, very important to, uh, to remember that the superior orbital fissure con is co in continuation with uh, the cavernous sinus. Here we see the sixth cranial nerve that we didn't see very well in the previous dissection uh, with further dissection of the cavernous sinus and how if we uh, divide the uh, lateral rectus muscle, we can see the superior and inferior division of the third uh, nerve. This is the ciliary ganglion with its branches. And we're going to see also the ophthalmic artery that at some point will give off the central retinal artery that we don't see in this picture. This is a, just a close-up view. Once we open the annulus of Zin, the extra uh, annular um, uh, components. So it's the trochlear and the frontal is a uh, branch of uh, V1. And then we see the intra-annular uh, components that are here below, which are the rest of the perineal nerves. So again, a superior view, uh, this is going to be important, the supraorbital nerve, which is going to also dictate our uh, extension of the supraorbital craniotomy. And if we go from anterior to posterior, uh, this is the right orbit, and we can see the orbital septum and the uh, superior tarsus, the inferior, and the orbicularis oculi that has been divided uh, on the external aspect of the orbit. So this is the eye, our uh, lacrimal gland, the medial and lateral canthus in the ligaments, superior oblique inferior oblique, and the relationship with the infraorbital nerve and uh, the orbital vein that is right here. So several different uh, uh, incisions that can be performed in the eyelid crease, in, um, in the eyebrow, and in that case, we need to be lateral to the supraorbital nerve and we can palpate the notch uh, in the orbital rim. And we can also perform like lateral, lateral cancer uh, incisions. And also we can access the inferior and medial aspects of the orbit as we will see. So this is an eyelid approach and uh, we can expose the orbital rim. And if we, uh, use the endoscope uh, to look uh, at this approach. This is the orbital roof. This is the periorbita. And we can see the anterior ethmoidal arteries. So we are right here looking at the right side of the orbit. And then we are going to see the superior uh, orbital fissure. 
And this is the meningo orbital band and continuates, uh, is in continuation with the superior orbital fissure um, and the cavernous sinus. And we can even expose the optic nerve in the optic canal. We have here the frontal lobe and uh, we have here the superior orbital fissure and part of the anterior clinoid process. So we can go uh, as far back, and this is all through uh, the orbit, um, drilling the, the orbital roof. Other kind of incisions that are not technically through the orbit, or just supraorbital. Uh, for instance, like an eyebrow, we can also do an eyelid incision, but this is like a supraorbital craniotomy. We want to be uh, medial to the um, supraorbital nerve. And uh, this is how it looks like after we drill the surface, uh, we can retract uh, gently the frontal lobe. And this is really like a, a great view uh, through that approach assisted with the endoscope of the optic nerve uh, and the carotid artery. This is the third cranial nerve and this is the tentorial edge. This is another view, uh, better looking at the chiasm. So we see the optic nerve in both sides. It's a great view and great approach. We can also do a transcarincular approaches, and this is a medial approach where we um, divide the soft tissue here. And we're going to see basically the anterior and, and posterior ethmoidal uh, canals. And this is a view of the lamina papyracea. So we are in the medial aspect of the orbit. If we drill, we can see clearly the mucosa uh, of the ethmoid cells and the labyrinth. And what if we uh, open inferiorly um, through a subconjunctival approach, uh, we can access the inferior aspect of the orbit that we said that was in, uh, related to the infraorbital nerves. And if we drill that, we can see the infraorbital artery, the infraorbital nerves, and this is the roof of the maxillary sinus. If we perform an incision externally here in the, uh, in the external canthus, then we can either with this incision, an ideal incision, or even a, an eyebrow incision extending laterally, we can really um, dissect the lateral orbital rim. And this is the, the, the joint of the sutures of the zygomatic bone, the frontal bone, and this is uh, the sphenoid uh, bone the greater wing. And through here, we can perform uh, an osteotomy laterally, which is corresponds to this aspect here. So then we are going to find the meningo orbital band here uh, with the superior orbital fissure. So if we dissect, this is the lateral aspect of the orbit. And if we drill, we go through, uh, we will follow towards the, uh, uh, the uh, sphenoid wing. And we are going to have laterally the temporalis fossa. So this is the temporalis muscle. Here we can see very nicely the temporal tip of the dura. And if we follow, so we are he, right here. Uh, if we follow this dissection, we can look at the floor of the middle fossa. And then we can follow towards the uh, um, cavernous sinus, which is a great approach for it. And then even Meckel's cave, this is V2 and this is V3. And here we'll be looking at foramen spinosum with the middle meningeal artery. And this is foramen ovale with V3. So really a great, uh, a great approach for intracranial pathologies, for cavernous sinus biopsies sometimes, um, for even uh, trigeminal schwannomas. And if we, and then um, our endoscopic endonasal approaches really opened a new window into the orbit, orbital apex and uh, optic nerve and optic canal that are going from medial to lateral. We already talked about the ethmoid labyrinth. We talked about the lamina papyracea and how it joins here and forms the orbital apex and the optic canal uh, posteriorly. The medial rectus and the inferior rectus muscles, and then the main window that we have to, uh, to operate on intraconal pathologies, which is between these two um, muscles. Sometimes we can go lateral to the inferior rectus muscle. We have here the infraorbital nerve, and that's really like basically uh, most of the times our um, internal lateral landmark uh, for um, endoscopic endonasal approaches.
uh, to the orbit. And we're going to see, this is a classical depiction of the optic canal, the carotid artery, and the cella. And looking at the optic uh, nerve in the optic canal, this is the carotid artery. Once we remove, and Dr. Zenonis is going to talk about that uh, in detail, if we open the dura, we can see that the ophthalmic artery really has different patterns and sometimes it's really medial and superior. So we have to be very careful when opening the dura here or resecting dura for tuberculum meningiomas not to injure the ophthalmic artery. So this is the most... Uh, dangerous pattern of uh, for endoscopic endonasal approaches, but uh, some, it can be medial, can be inferior, or can be uh, inferolateral, uh, like in this other specimen. So this is a, a view of the ophthalmic artery. This is the uh, classical view of the endonasal, um, endoscopic endonasal of the cavernous sinus. And if we look at the anatomy of uh, the uh, exposure of the orbit and optic canal. We know that uh, these are the ethmoid labyrinths and we can see the lamina papyracea, we can see the skull base and the sphenoid sinus. If we remove the lamina papyracea, we find the periorbita and this is the orbital apex and the optic canal. There's, a, there's a, an angle between the optic canal and the main axis of the orbit that goes this way is not a straight line. So we can see that angle here is the orbital apex and the annulus of Zin. So opening the periorbital, removing the, uh, the fat of the orbit, we see the uh, optic nerve here. And uh, this is the medial and inferior rectus muscles. This is the main window to work from the stoscopic and the nasal um, perspective. And here we are seeing the central retinal artery which is uh, essential to, to preserve. And this is an inferior view with the 45 degree endoscopes of this uh, internal retinal artery, central retinal artery. So we see the inferior aspect of the third nerve here and here working lateral to the inferior rectus muscle. And this is uh, a final overview of the anatomy. And for instance, just to illustrate the uh, surgical anatomy of this, uh, a classical case of a cavernous hemangioma, and a very quick video to illustrate uh, the anatomy. So uh, we divided, in this case, the middle turbinate, um, and then opening the sphenoid sinus, the ethmoid sinus, so this is the skull base, lamina papyracea, opening the periorbita, exactly in the inferior uh, medial corner. And then, of course, we see first uh, the orbital fat. And we start to dissect between the inferior and medial rectus muscles and start uh, extracting and dissecting the uh, hemangioma. And then just, um, this is the final view. And this is the postoperative CT scan. So this is mainly what I uh, wanted to uh, talk about, uh, 360 degrees around the, uh, the orbit from the transcranial and the nasal and transorbital standpoint. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll take uh, any questions. These are um, dissections performed by our, our fellows and by myself as well some of them, and um, also with Dr. Joshua Kafumitaka, some of his dissections. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. This is, of course, beautiful. Um, and uh, uh, let me see if there is any... Uh, Maria, unfortunately, has to leave uh, to, to the OR, so she's not going to be able to stay with us. And uh, all I can tell you is Nima Amini said fantastic and clear. Um, I guess... Thank uh, uh, thanks, Maria. Um, Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye. Good luck. Bye. Uh, Chris, why don't we have you next? Great. And is everybody able to see my screen now and hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah, perfect. You're good. 
Fantastic. I'm going to be talking about orbital surgery, what a neurosurgeon needs to know. And I want to thank you for the invitation. Uh, Dr. Mar Marcos has done more than any other person to bring transorbital approaches into main mainstream skull-based surgeon and encourage uh, the participation of ophthalmologists and uh, otolaryngologists in the skull-based society. And um, there are also, I also have a number of uh, friends who are ophthalmologists and otolaryngologists at University of Miami who are fantastic people. Uh, no disclosures relative uh, related to this uh, presentation. So um, when I was nearly uh, uh, finished with the presentation, I thought I'd have a little fun and put into chat GP, what should neurosurgeons know about orbital surgery? And it was actually pretty fun. First thing is a thorough understanding of anatomy and physiology. Know the approaches in the, uh, of the orbit and adjacent structures, understand the pathologies, know imaging techniques. Now here's a good one, be able to collaborate effectively with ophthalmologists and otolaryngologists, work together to develop a treatment plan that addresses a patient's unique needs and be committed to learning the latest advances. Well, I've outlined in green the ones that I'm gonna be covering uh, today and I'm not gonna cover um, uh, anatomy uh, very heavily after that excellent uh, presentation that we had. But in terms of surgical uh, planning, what is the ideal uh, pathway to uh, quote Julius Caesar quid pretium, which means at what price? And that's one of the main uh, criteria we should be thinking about. These procedures should be minimally disruptive, but appropriately invasive. Whether a lesion is a skin cancer or a brain stem lesion is not the choice of the surgeon. And so invasivity is not up to us. The pathway should be short and straight. They should allow comfortable instrumentation. They should allow zero or 30 degree angled viewing, minimal brain retraction, and an excellent optical cavity. So you need to think about retraction of the adjacent tissue such as fat and muscle. There should be possibility for multi-portal surgery for pseudo-death perception, minimal bone removal because this takes time and may require reconstruction, and require minimal ICU stay and allow a rapid recovery. Well, why endoscopic orbital surgery? Well, you saw in the last beautiful presentation, the, the, the uh, anatomy was presented endoscopically. And the reason is you can see so well. If you do a, an open approach, as you see on top here, the lighting is right in front of your eyes and any magnification is uh, uh, loops that you may be wearing. And you have to retract the uh, orbit, the uh, globe quite a bit to see lesions and you get shadowing. But with an endoscopic approach, you have a high amount of uh, uh, magnification as possible. You have a narrow cylindrical pathway. The light is at the end of the endoscope. And so you don't have to have, you don't have as much shadowing and you don't have to retract the globe nearly as much. And that's very important. <clears throat> so endoscopic orbital, orbital surgery allows smaller incisions, less globe retractor, retraction, improved lighting, better magnification, improved fat and muscle retraction. And this is key here. It allows two surgeons or more to work synchronously, and it allows the entire team to watch the operation on the monitors. And all of these factors add up into improved precision, less morbidity, and better outcomes. Now look at these images of the medial orbital wall and the orbital apex. This is a beautiful optical, uh, optical cavity here without any fat herniation before you uh, open the peri uh, periorbita. So this gives us very good control of the uh, optical cavity. It's coplanar view viewing, as I'll discuss momentarily, and it allows more effective reconstruction working from inside the orbit. Um, Here's an example of doing an orbital apex and optic nerve de um, uh, decompression. You can see the optical cavity. You can see when, in, when uh, performing endoscopy through the orbit and through the posterior ethmoid sinuses. So you can see that the uh, apex ethmoid artery, you can see the carotid artery very nicely. So this gives you superb viewing. Well, the elements of an endoscopic procedure are fairly similar regardless of the site that you're doing. You need a portal. You need a pathway or a corridor if it's a preformed uh, pathway, such as a nasal cavity, and then an optical cavity. And uh, if we're using, uh, if we're doing pituitary surgery, we have a preformed optical cavity from uh, the sphenoid sinus. Obviously, you need a surgical target, and you also need effective uh, retraction and instrumentation. Well, the transorbital, um, uh, excuse me, the transnasal approach is the mo most common. Uh, endoscopic skull-based procedure we, we do. Uh, 
And this uses a pre-existing corridor and a self-retained optical cavity as long as it's within the nose. Now, when you leave the nose, you lo no longer have a retained optical cavity. The technique, the instruments, hemostasis and, the reconstru and reconstruction are excellent. And we export these to uh, the techniques that we do uh, transorbitally. And this shows the, the primary area that we access with the transnasal approaches, but it's not perfect. When you're operating in pituitary, you need to have at least 15 degrees of separation uh, to prevent instrument contact, as you can see here. And we call this the narrow funnel effect. The um, issue, the um, this issue of instrument con uh, conflict can be significant. So you can see if we're operating through the nose, it's hard to get that 18 degree of separation. But if we add other portals, all of a sudden we can open that up and get much greater se uh, separation between our hands and instrument. The other challenge is that of biplanar surgery. So if you're operating through the nose, you have to transition into a different plane to operate within the orbit. And what we ideally do is operate in a coplanar approach so you don't have to transition as you can see here in this biplanar approach. This is an example of a publication showing periorbital uh, suspension for ac uh, endoscopic access to the frontal sinus. And here the surgeons are trying to access this through the orbit. <clears throat> and you can see what it looks like here. It's very difficult to tell what's going on and your optical cavity is very tiny. Now compare that with a transorbital approach to the frontal sinus. This is coplanar, short, direct, minimally disruptive, it's easy, and one to three surgeons can work through this. The other issue uh, with biportal surgery is we can see our instruments better. If we do a monoportal approach through the nose, you can't see the tip of the instrument. And in fact, you don't know what instrument I'm using here. And so that's through the transnasal and endoscopic approach here. But if we do a superior transorbital approach, all of a sudden, you can see the tip of the instrument and you get a pseudo depth perception because you know where you're, uh, where you're working exactly. And that's biportal surgery. Whether using monoportal or multiportal technique, as you can see here in these different vectors, you have to uh, plan very carefully to decide what's gonna be optimal for you. And these are just some of the endoscopic approaches that I use here. These are all scarless techniques that I use on a regular basis. Well, the orbits, as you've seen, are centrally located, and there are many potential corridors and pathways, both within the orbit and through the orbit. And one of the beautiful things uh, that enables us to do this surgery is the majority of the fat is what uh, um, an ophthalmologist, um, ophthalmologist in Pittsburgh, Tanya Stefko, uh, refers to as squishy structures, so they can be displaced. But you can see there's a large potential space here on both sides above and below the orbit. Well, with this comes unique, unique safety concerns, namely protecting the cornea. Well, if you use a corneal shield, you can't see the pupil unless it's a clear shield. You want to be able to see the pupil. A temporary tarsorophy suture where you suture the eyelids together is definitely helpful if we're using transcutaneous portals and place it at the medial or lateral limbus so you can see the pupil uh, to monitor what's happening. Hydration is very important using an ophthalmic lubricant and having ongoing what I call communication with the pupil. In other, in other words, watching what's happening to it is very important. It's very important to be very gentle when you retract the orbital uh, contents. It should be minimal traction, gentle, blunt, low pressure, dynamic, meaning you're moving a retractor and you watch the pupil. So never tilt the retractor in behind the globe. You wanna have a paraxial retraction following the lateral orbit. Well, the average volume of the orbit is 30 cc's, and yet the average pathway volume is only 3 cc's, so we're only using 10% of this. And this shows a, a surgical mapping study we did that demonstrated the volume of these pathways. Well, certainly critical in these um, procedures is neurovascular safety. You have the same uh, concerns that you have with other endoscopic approaches to the brain, but you have more pathways to choose from. So it's really essential to plan the safety, safest pathway with no tight neurovascular structure uh, crossings. There are times when you will cross neurovascular structures, but not in a threatening fashion. Well, there are four transorbital pathways. As you can see here, these are the main ones. Uh, one or more um, pathways to each quadrant, as you can see here, and these were reviewed very nicely. 
But when I discuss this, I like to think about this as a global selection. It's not a 360 degree uh, selection of approaches as many people say, but you have to think globally around all angles of the orbit. And contrary to what uh, we're gonna be learning in the, skull, in the next skull base meetings uh, that the skull base, where they say the skull base is flat, the skull base is definitely not flat. And that's one of the things that allows us to use transorbital approaches to get to the brain in a minimally disruptive approach. Well, the portals were very nicely uh, discussed in terms of how you uh, access this, and I'm just going to go through it briefly. To the superior uh, um, portal, we simply use a preceptal approach. Now, it's true that we want to try to save the, um, the um, neurovascular pedicles here, but if you have to transect a um, supraorbital um, nerve, it's, it's not a big deal because in two or three months, that sensation is going to, to return. The medial approach, as we talked about, is a precuruncular or transcuruncular approach. It's very direct. Inferior, you just pull, sorry about that, you pull the lid forward and incise directly onto the orbital rim. And in the lateral approach, you can just dissect directly onto the lateral orbit by pulling the lids laterally. The key area that we need to be thinking about is the superior orbital fissure and its contents, as well as the optic nerves. In general, in most cases, there are actually three um, uh, ethmoid vessels uh, rather than two. We did a study on that. And one of the uh, key, nice things about this is um, the interventional radiologist will not uh, embolize the ethmoids, but you can come in here at the beginning of the case and, and um, uh, cauterize them so you can control hemostasis. Let's look at the superior uh, quadrant approach. Here we use an upper lid crease approach, and this shows how very shallow the approach is. And it takes, I don't know, between five to 10 minutes to get here. And this is the area of the orbit we can access or we can remove this bone as needed. And it does get us to the anterior clinoid here, the optic strut, optic nerve, like that. You can tailor the, the uh, portal to the pathway you uh, need. It can be quite small. And this schematic shows the areas you can access within the orbit and through the orbit and the anterior cranial fossa and um, between the uh, orbits as well. More schematic showing this, you can also access the frontal sinus for pathology there. You can access the contralateral frontal sinus, contralateral orbit and the brain. This is uh, when we were operating on a meningioma, the left orbit uh, and anterior clinoid that also involved the temporal lobe. And here you see the internal carotid artery, the optic tract back here. See, we're looking uh, more posteriorly, and here's the olfactory nerve above. So it really gets you very nice exposure. Well, let's look at the medial quadrant here. Here's a precuruncular approach, and, term, and you follow the posterior limb of the medial cantle tendon to the bone of the lamina propricia, as you can see here. And this allows us to get above or below the skull base. Here, you, I've opened the orbit so you can see the level of the skull base. And so you can actually operate intracranially, extradurally from this approach or intradurally. This shows some of the act, some of the areas that you can approach the interorbital skull base very nicely. This is what it looks like, minimally disruptive. And here we're removing the optic nerve for melanoma within the nerve and sparing the globe. And uh, you can see the optical cavity and the retraction that you can get through that. And if we look inferiorly, uh, we simply pull the lid uh, inferiorly like this. This is the area that we can get to as we describe, as was described uh, very nicely before. And this shows the, the optical cavity that you'll have. Here's an orbital fracture. Here's a chondrosarcoma. But you get a very large viewing ca uh, capacity through this. The lateral approach you can see here, we can either do cantotomy and cantholysis, splitting the lid here, or we can incise directly onto the uh, periorbita. We can access infratemporal fossa, um, the uh, greater wing of the sphenoid here. And if we look down here, we can see foramen rotundum. And a nice landmark is that foramen rotundum and the optic nerve form a vertical line here that will help you orient yourself. And this is what that approach looks like. This is the approach when you're going into the cavernous sinus or similar areas. This is the, these are the areas you can get within the orbit. And this shows um, accessing the an encephalocele in the greater wing of this uh, in the lateral recesses of the sphenoid sinus. Very nice exposure. And by combining these trans uh, nasal and transorbital approaches, these are the areas of the skull base that we can now access. Well, what about uh, planning these procedures? Here's a 63-year-old male that uh, came into my clinic after declining a craniotomy um, that was recommended for a severe uh, CSF leak through his nose. And here you can see the defect in the middle cranial fossa where the CSF leak is. 
in the sphenoid sinus. And planning this, the correct answer shouldn't depend on your specialty. Now to give the neurosurgeons a hard time uh, showing craniotomies here, okay, this is bias, but this isn't minimally disruptive surgery. If we look at uh, a transnasal approach through this vector here, you can see we have to go through multiple layers of bone and it's a 75 millimeter approach and you have to remove this floor of the sphenoid sinus. So that's a lot of dissecting. If we do a transmaxillary vector down here, it's only 60, 60 millimeters long. We still have to go through multiple bone layers as you can see here. Um, this approach is less likely than a transnasal to damage the vidian and V2 nerves. Uh, but the sphenoid floor is also removed. If we look at the lateral transnasal approach, however, excuse me, the lateral transorbital approach, as you can see here, it's a 30 millimeter approach. You only have to go through one bone layer. The vidian nerve and V2 are spared and the sphenoid uh, floor is spared. And, and this is what supports the reconstruction. So if we're looking here endoscopically on the left side, you can see we've opened the greater wing and the sphenoid bone very thin. We've gotten in to the uh, CSF like mucosa, mucosa sinoid sinus is still intact. Then we uh, open it up. And here we're looking across the sphenoid sinus, as you can see here. Here's the floor of the sphenoid sinus and here's our encephalocele. We bipolar that, reduce it, fill it with fat. And the, um, we just close the lateral canthus and the operation is done. Here's pre and post-op. And he, uh, this is what he looked like a week after surgery. He said he never had pain after surgery, took no pain meds. And uh, this was done 11 years ago and he never had a recurrence and I've done others similar to this. Um, seven year old uh, post anterior and posterior uh, frontal sinus fractures with a large CSF leak. Again, you can uh, go right through the upper eyelid. You remove the mucosa from the uh, frontal sinus. And here's what he looked like two years ago, never had diplopia CSF leak repaired. Here's a patient with an orbital abscess. And when you get imaging, you see that the patient actually had an osteoblastoma. And we did a quadruporal resection going through the nose, both sides, through the orbit, both sides. And you can see her uh, pathology resolved and she did nicely. Um, an orbital, frontal, and epidural abscess, as you can see here, go through the orbital roof, drain the purulence in the uh, frontal sinus, um, do a small craniotomy, irrigate, and your operation is done. 94-year-old male with a brain abscess was told he was not a surgical candidate. I was asked if we could do this endoscopically. Same approach. You can see going through the orbital roof, through the frontal sinus, into the brain, and drained it, and he did very nicely. But a key point is that transorbital approaches are highly effective for retraction of fat and muscle, meaning that you can create an excellent optical cavity. Here's an aneurysmal bone cyst, and here's pre-op and post-op, post and you can see the extent of the bone, uh, both on the anterior cranial fossa and orbit that we've removed, and again, preoperative and post-op. And here we've done the reconstruction through the orbit and it mimics very nicely the um, patient's pre-morbid anatomy. And in fact, after this re resection, she had uh, diplopia only in far lateral gaze. Now here we're doing transorbital resection and a bi uh, biportal approach. This is what the dissection looks like through the nose. So we're instrumenting through the eye working um, through uh, visualizing through the nose so you can see the tip of your instrument working. And now we're doing transorbital viewing and instrumenting, instrumenting through the orbit. You see the retraction of the orbital contents. And here we're um, decompressing the optic nerve. And here you can see with this viewpoint, you can see above the optic nerve and below very nicely. And you can retract the uh, frontal lobe uh, as well. And again, Transnasal perspective, transorbital perspective. Both are valid, both are good, but they have different applications. Recurrent adenoid cystic uh, carcinoma. She was already blind in the left side and we needed to uh, decompress the contralateral optic nerve. So here we're looking at an ipsilateral transorbital approach, frontal lobe dura, removing the tumor from the orbit on this side. And after we remove that, look at the extent of the decompression, frontal lobe dura, optic nerve, orbital apex. And this is the uh, contraportal approach operating through the opposite side that gives you that view. And again, this shows you the extent of that view uh, that you can see. I showed this image before of the optical cavity you can attain seeing all of the optic nerve. Uh, 
optic nerve decompression. Here you're seeing the optic canal. And as we look here, there's a fracture through the optic canal and there's a fracture in the internal carotid artery as well. So this is a very challenging dissection. And, and you can see we just lift this bone very gently off of that. And here we're lifting the optic canal out. Here's exposed dura underneath. And then we just repair the dura. Here's a dural uh, repair matrix on top of it. Metastatic esthesioneuroblastoma, greater wing of the sphenoid. We're going to come straight through. Orbital contents, temporalis muscle, um, temporal lobe dura, frontal lobe dura, foramen rotundum, wide exposure, no diplopia postoperatively. And she did very nicely. And this is what it looked like afterwards. As I finish up here, a uh, 78-year-old male with meningioma uh, referred after five prior cranies. You can see the meningioma around the anterior clinoid and the temporal lobe. And again, we do a superior uh, lid incision. Here's the dissection. Here's tumor in the orbital apex and working posteriorly. And then we can see the optic uh, nerve, optic tract, uh, internal carotid artery, ACA, MCA, and the um, olfactory nerve. So very good exposure. So how do you learn this? The learning curve uh, is pretty steep. And this comes from an article we wrote with uh, Alberto de Soma called Endoscopic Transorbital Level Levels of Dif Difficulty. So you start out with bone lesions, and then you work with uh, CSF leaks trauma, and then you work into uh, lesions within the bone, sphenoorbital meningioma, and then work into intraconal lesions uh, after that. Then you can go into what we call stage three, where you're going into temporal parenchyma lesions, um, trigeminal schwannoma, um, where you're taking down the meningoorbital band, um, and in stage four, your um, anterior clinoid meningioma, internal carotid artery, working further in stage uh, four, we're taking, uh, we're dealing with lesions in the mesial temporal lobe, um, cavernous uh, sinus, in those areas, and then working in stage uh, five, uh, MCA aneurysms, um, petroclival lesions, and so you need to work uh, through these slowly and start out in a cadaver lab, as you can see here. This is uh, Dr. DeSoma and his group taking down um, the uh, tentorial incisor and working on the brainstem, as you can see back here. It's also helpful to attend a course. Uh, the fourth international hands-on uh, workshop will be um, in South Korea in uh, November. You can uh, uh, ask me about this. Uh, NASBIS workshops, and we're uh, writing a book on this transorbital endoscopic and brain surgery. So to conclude, this is my email if anybody want um, more information. Quid predium, do, uh, at, what, um, at what cost? There are many endoscop endoscopic approaches to and through the orbit. Plan the approaches carefully and use vector analysis. It's essential to have effective and safe retraction of the orbital contents and multi-portal approaches will improve the viewing and, and provide pseudo depth perception and also allow you to work on uh, multiple sides of an orb orbital lesion. This is an exciting field with new applications and major innovations that are on the way. Thank you so much. Chris, that was masterful. Thank you so much, uh, really great. And of course, we're saving the questions till after George uh, speaks, uh, but uh, I can already see questions coming up in the Q&A chat box. Uh, uh, George, go ahead and uh, tell us how to dance around the orbit. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, but yeah, go ahead, but hit the presentation mode. Did we lose you, uh, George? Seems like he's frozen. Frozen. He's frozen. Yeah, he's frozen. George, if you, if you can hear us, you're frozen. I think he, yeah, he's still here. Let me send him a message. Oh, you think he's, okay. Did we lose him, Iggy? I don't see him now. He's here, but something happened. 
He is on the list here. Wait. He... No, no, I don't see him. No, no, he's gone. He must I have lost the internet issue. Yeah, the internet. I think. I'm sure he's reconnecting. Well, let me see if there are. Uh... So okay, uh, Chris, uh, if Chris, if you're still here, let me run a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, uh, Nima Amini asks, saying the sphenoid floor plays a key role for that reconstruction, perfect entry through the lateral. Uh, oh, I, I guess he was he's asking how common is the CSF leak uh, from what you, the case you described with CSF leak? How common is that? We it's it's it, yeah. a it's a it's a great question. Um, overall, it's a rare source, but it's a particularly challenging source because um, many cases who uh, have a uh, craniotomy will end up with uh, numbness in V2 and a dry eye uh, from the Vidian nerve. Um, <laughs> working on a, a paper with um, Ted Schwartz about that. So um, it used to be thought that this, this was a leak in Sternberg's canal. I think that uh, that thinking has maybe gone out of favor. But in any case, it, it's un, un, unusual. But when you do see it, it's a challenging area to get to. But I found that uh, you can get to it quite simply without much morbidity. And, and having the sphenoid floor intact is very nice because it'll support your fat graft. And um, you can put a little added packing that dissolves and it prevents the patient from uh, blowing air into the area and like that. So um, it's very, it's highly effective. And, and while you're, while I'm asking you questions, while George is reconnecting, Dr. Keaton Piper is saying, is there a measurable limit on how much you can retract the orbit? So um, all of our um, pathways, we retract the uh, globe less than one centimeter. And we know that we have never had a case of blindness from that. Um, and I have never pushed the globe until we have had blindness. So we don't have an answer to that, except um, that it is demonstrated, it's been demonstrated to be highly effective and safe. Um, and that there are multiple meta-analyses going over the complications and, and blindness is extremely uh, rare. Okay, uh, thank you. George, are you back? Maybe you lost some bandwidth there or Wi-Fi? Yeah, my, my computer crashed, uh, logged in from my, let me see if I can, I'm logging okay. in right now again from the okay. hard line. Okay. Um, okay, no worries, no worries. It should be like one minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise the Wi-Fi is, I don't think it's going to make it. But, um, okay. Something uh, Chris, I'll, I'll ask you, I'll keep asking you questions. Uh, talk to us about how important is it to reconstruct <laughs> the roof of the orbit, whether you use a transorbital or whether you use a craniotomy. I mean, in the old days, I thought it was essential to reconstruct the orbital roof to avoid pulsatile uh, exophthalmus or enophthalmus, but Bill Caldwell and I and others have discovered you, you actually don't need to, but but love to hear your perspective. I agree 100%. And when it is uh, reconstructed with um, uh, external table or other uh, bone grafts, it tends uh, to be very uh, non-anatomic. Um, so I've uh, left the vast majority of the um, uh, uh, orbital roof unreconstructed. And yes, for one to two weeks, the patients may have uh, pulsatile exophthalmus, but then it uniformly resolves. I have never had a case where it persists. Have, have you had a, a recent one where it does? No, uh, my longest one, though, is about five months, actually. Mm -hmm. he, I remember him very well. A very lovely rabbi, wonderful rabbi. Um, just, it went away. It went away. But it took a long time. This is definitely my longest. Yeah. And uh, But we really removed the entire roof. Okay, George, sounds like you're, looks like you're back online. If you put, if you go on, yeah, we got you now. You're muted when you can, you can unmute yourself. Perfect. And you can hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Well, it's, it's hard to follow uh, these two fantastic talks. Uh, I've learned so much for both from, from Chris and Maria uh, and, uh, uh, not only today, but all, over the years as well. And I think, thank you, Jacques, for inviting me for this, this fantastic series. So um, I, the prior uh, couple of talks, um, I think had a little bit more of an emphasis 
on the orbit itself. We're going to move a little further back. And then today we're just going to discuss a little bit how to dance around um, the optic nerve. And um, this, this title, I, I like this analogy of dancing around the optic nerve, which is more or less almost dancing around a fire. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, the optic nerve and the optic chiasm, perhaps more than any other nerve that we deal with, have the less has the less capacity to take um, any pushing around, and uh, particularly the microvasculature around the optic nerve is is just so unforgiving. Uh, so it's 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 so important to be very very careful around it and devise strategies to. Uh, minimize um, retraction of the nerve and disruption of its vasculature. Um, and um, if we do, too, if, we get, if we get too brave, it's not unusual for us to get burned. Now, I'm not sure there is any um, there's any debate that's a more of a hot topic in uh, in scalp based uh, conferences and discussions um, when it comes to um, choosing like the approach for uh, lesions that are surrounding the optic nerve, uh, particularly when it comes to choosing uh, like a ventral or lateral um, approach and endonasal or more lateral approach. And um, I've been lucky to uh, to have trained on with, with many uh, of the pioneers of both the lateral and ventral approaches and uh, also the radio surgery. So, um, and over time, you kind of put everything together and develop, develop your own preferences. So uh, today it's kind of, Kind of my take on um, how do do I go around and try and choose an approach when it comes to lesions around the optic nerve? Hey, Joe, so, Joe, Joe, sorry to interrupt you. I, I your video videos look a little choppy. I'm sure you're going to show some videos later. Are they like these? Like the kid who was using the gloves, it was not smooth. Is this what how it was supposed to be? You know what I'm saying? Um, we, we can we can wait and see what yeah. Let's, so I, can I can always pull it on the on the other one. I was hope, hoping that this one would have a little bit more bandwidth, but um, yeah, it, it it may not be, but we'll see. We'll see. I can let you know. Let's keep going. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> so one of the one of the rules that I try to follow is that um, I try to avoid crossing neurovascular structures, and also respect the arachnoid and microvasculature. And in order to do that. I think one of the most important rules that is not my role, but following a lot of the rules of, um, uh, of the skull based surgery is follow a tumor from where it came from. If you follow a tumor from where it came from, you're more likely to stay within that uh, onion uh, skin and try and preserve the arachnoid and the microvasculature. The optic nerve doesn't take a lot of manipulation, particularly when it's not already stretched. And then working together with um, a lot of our uh, partners, either oculoplastics or ENT, to try and find the optimal approach usually is key. <clears throat> There's also important anesthesia considerations to do putting a pre-induction A-line and keeping the maps up, steroids. And one of the things that um, I've come to do over the years is to try to avoid fluid swings. So uh, try to avoid too much mannitol. If you think you're going to retract and you're not going to get to a cistern early, um, try and give uh, and put a lumbar drain, for example, and, and drain fluid like that, as opposed to give them 100 mannitol, then they get dehydrated, and then it is a catch up after that. And of course, as Dr. Morkos always um, teaches us, remember to break all the rules if needed. Um, so, uh, the ventral versus lateral skull base, uh, if we can imagine <clears throat> the embrace of all the cranial nerves. Um, it's very easy to sort of separate what comes lateral to the cranial nerves versus medial to the cranial nerves. And that's just a good rule of a thumb of not crossing any neurovascular structures. Um, and of course, the ventral surgery of a corridor can be very versatile in the sagittal plane. Uh, but also, um, as Dr. Melfi teaches us to try and, and use the arachnoid as your friend, if we follow the epicenter of the tumor, uh, if you, we think of a fist going into a balloon with the outer arachnoid being the outer, the outer layer um, and the tumor being the fist, then all the vessels or nerves are sort of in between them. So trying to follow the tumor from when it came from uh, is usually a good strategy to try and, and stay on the good side of all those um, uh, small vessels. 
So uh, this is a very uh, straightforward um, tubercular cell in NGMA. And um, usually when we, does this show a little bit better or is it choppy as well? No, it's choppy. Uh, I mean, we can see it, but it's missing some frames. You know, that, you know it is choppy, yes. Okay. You, well, um, you have a better Wi-Fi kind of server or is it going to be complicated? I mean, we, the, the image is very clear, just choppy. Okay. I can, I can try and pull it on my, if it's, if it's horrible, I can try and pull it on my laptop. But um, in the interest of time, why don't we keep going for now? Okay. All right. So um, I'm not going to belabor this, but this is a pretty straightforward um, mini geoma. The arachnoidal layers are very well preserved here. And this is what you first do and kind of feel good about yourself with preservation, all the uh, arachnoidal layers around that, uh, around that supracellar cistern. Uh, but obviously that's not always the case. Um, this is an, another example of, um, of a patient that has like profound invasion in the optic canal. This is almost uh, encasing the, the optic nerves here. And that's not unusual for um, tumors and the tuberculum cell meningiomas in particular, or diaphragmatic ones, to be a, uh, invading the inferior medial optic canal. Um, and uh, slight extension over the canal is, is not an absolute limitation. We'll talk a little bit about how lateral you can go, uh, but it does exposure good, it, it does require good exposure uh, of the optic canals, almost like a 270 degree approach. Um, and uh, usually the hyperostosis that happens with these tumors does give us a little bit further leeway into uh, the supra optic space. Um, now, this is a tumor that, um, as opposed to the prior one that we saw, is highly invasive. This um, it invading the arachnoid and, and having this view, I believe um, it, it's superior in, in order to uh, really understand uh, how is enveloping all the microvasculature, um, the uh, branches of the superopicial artery going both to the stalk as well as um, as well as the optic nerve, and um, again following them where they came from allows you to sort of um, chase them without necessarily crossing them, and then going into that inferior medial optic canal and um, and chasing the tumor there. Of course, uh, retrochiasmatic tumors, that's a natural corridor uh, to follow these tumors. Um, I'm not gonna belabor this, uh, but following under the optic nerve, there's a more rare case of a hypothalamic astrocytoma uh, that we thought originally was um, a craniopharyngioma. And you have beautiful view into the third ventricle and the um, interpedungular cistern. So what are really the limitations? Uh, is it extension lateral to a carotid? I don't believe that in most cases, extension lateral to a carotid is a limitation because as you're expanding your view coming transnasally, uh, this part again is in the correct side of the arachnoid and you can peel this part of the tumor in. How about extension to the roof or the orbit? And again, there's, there's multiple uh, papers showing that up to the mid orbit, um, is a fair game, and by, uh, as Dr. Mo uh, said, um, retract the squishy structures, like Tonya says, um, we can get further access into the lateral orbit up to its midpoint, more or less. What is a limitation, however, is extension into the clinoids. And a, a tumor like this that is completely surrounding uh, the anterior processes, uh, that's a tumor that if we go uh, transnasally, we're going to leave residual tumor. Um, and that's, that's an area that is a limitation. For example, uh, now, um, if we have significant hyperostosis, like such as in this tumor here, uh, where we have significant hyperostosis over the clinoids, um, this actually expands our corridor. We can get a little bit further past the mid optic canals, which is usually what we consider as a limitation. And uh, as you can see here, Here's the optic nerve, and then the, see how much these hyperostosis allow us to get superior to the optic nerve and get almost more than a 270 degree decompression uh, into that anterior clinoid. 
Um, and that can expand a little bit our exposure, but still as the tumor comes uh, lateral to a clinoid or further, more anterior into a clinoid, uh, these approaches is, is further compromised. So um, such as this tumor that um, we saw earlier than an operant approach, perhaps uh, an approach where uh, we do like a transbasal approach. Um, it's an approach that it may be ideal here. Um, or obviously if, if we choose some other approach, we're probably gonna leave some residual, which is also okay. Um, but uh, this is, is the approach that I chose for this patient, for example. Now, which of the supracellular meningiomas are amenable to open approaches more than others? And which are the ones that we think of in terms of choosing the ventral corridor more than uh, a lateral corridor, even though you're gonna uh, leave uh, uh, a residual. So both an olfactory group meningioma and the plantar meningiomas they uh, come from more anterior than the microvasculature of the optic nerve. So the effect of them is that they splay, as we know, the optic nerves apart, and uh, they uh, displace the microvasculature posteriorly. So when we come from an open approach, uh, usually we can still follow the tumor avoiding from where it came from. Now, tuberculum cell meningiomas tend to push some of the optic nerves superiorly um, more than uh, posteriorly. And that's even more accentuated in diaphragmatic meningiomas, such as this one here. So diaphragmatic meningiomas in, in these tumors, usually the uh, optic chiasm is actually prefixed as opposed to postfixed. Um, so when you come from a lateral approach, you essentially the tumor is completely on the other side of you. And then the superhypophysial vessels are in between you and, and the tumor. These are an example of a diaphragmatic meningioma. Again, you see that there's some lateral extension la uh, past the carotid, but that's usually not, not that much of an issue. Um, there's a, also somewhat of a flat skull base, which uh, is, is also uh, more usual with these tumors as opposed to um, the tuberculum cell meningiomas that they usually have the hyperostosis that sometimes can provide like a favorable um, angle of attack. But uh, this tumor is, is going all the way superiorly, posteriorly uh, behind the optic nerve. So when we come from lateral, uh, it's going on the complete wrong side of, of what you would do. Um, again, the superhypophysial vessels are in between you and, and the tumor, and then they're diving posteriorly, even in the posterior fossa and the interpeduncular system like we showed earlier. I'm not going to belabor this, but also the stalk can also can uh, even be enveloped in these tumors. Uh, and they're generally kind of a different animal than uh, the rest of the quote unquote supracellular meningiomas. So these are, are tumors that I would rather leave some uh, residual on if there is an extension in the anticlinoid, let's say, as opposed to try and tackle them um, with an open approach. Now, when tumors start from laterally, such as, for example, you know, clinoidal meningiomas, et cetera, then obviously the approach is lateral. And even if you have a residual of a clinoidal meningioma that's extended into supracellular space, attacking it from a medial uh, or a ventral corridor, I believe is a mistake because then all the microvasculature is going to be in, in between you and the tumor. And that, um, that's a mistake that uh, has been done before. Um, of course, we have like the standard um, open approaches. This is a, a COZ approach uh, for, for this tumor um, and uh, answer clinoidectomy, falling down and identifying the carotid, finding the carotid and sort of excavating from the inside out. Um, I don't know how much is, it's, how well it's playing, uh, but again, sort of working from the inside out again, uh, starting from the anticlinoid and then connecting uh, laterally to medially. But um, the transorbital approaches, and we, we've heard already two beautiful um, talks about this, um, are all, another very viable uh, way to get there. And uh, there are a lot of variations. Some of them are transorbital. Some of them are um, through incisions around the eye. We do this uh, surgery with our oculoplastic surgeons. Um, and some of our go-to procedures are the eyebrow, which uh, gives you beautiful exposure to the anterocranial fossa. Uh, you can um, remove the rim, for example, to get a little bit more superior exposure for uh, an ACOM. If you extend it a little bit inferiorly uh, and, and 
extend uh, below the orbital zygomatic suture. You can get a good exposure in the middle cranial fossa as well. Um, the lateral canthus with the lateral vitotomy is more of a middle cranial fossa exposure. It's beautiful exposure for um, either uh, sphenoorbitomy angiomas or uh, trigeminal uh, schwannomas, et cetera. Uh, and when you combine them, when we saw a, a beautiful um, example by Dr. Mo, uh, when you combine it with an eyelid incision, you can really do like a mini OZ exposure and, and have a beautiful exposure in both the anterior, anterior and middle cranial fossa. Um, trans eyelid incision, transfrontal for um, a more medial exposure uh, in the anterior cranial base. Um, now, large frontal sinuses and large subarabial anthemoids are things that always try to take in consideration. Uh, and then it is a little bit harder to repair these uh, lesions um, when you do a transorbital approach. Um, you can, of course, use fat, and we do raise a, a pericranial flap. Uh, there's a mini pericranial flap, but when you have a large defect, that can definitely be a, a contraindication, at, at least for me. Uh, I can't take credit for any of these cosmetic results, but again, working with in a multidisciplinary manner um, and with Dr. Stefko as well as the others, um, you can get very good uh, cosmetic results um, after transorbital exposures that um, avoids a lot of uh, the disruption that comes with a pure lateral approach through um, the muscle. This can be used for both intraaxial lesions using a, a, a more inferior to superior exposure. This is an example of a, um, an ependymoma actually in the uh, anterior right frontal lobe. Um, intraaxial tumors such as an epidermoid for the lateral canthus or sphenoorbital meningiomas such as this one, uh, the lateral canthus exposure using um, the um, opening of the eye as well can provide like a very good exposure. And this uh, eyelid incision as well as the lateral canthus can be used for even larger tumors such as this one here. Uh, and it really provides like an exposure, almost like a COZ approach. Um, now, this is not a, a, an approach that I, I would at least at this point uh, tackle endoscopically. I do like the approach that it gives you know, with an open approach and using all the same tools that we use um, with uh, traditional skull base surgery. So um, again, working with archaeoplastic surgeons, um, mapping the frontalis nerve for our lateral extent of our exposure um, and the zygomatic branches um, and raising the flap. The osteotomies are essentially the same manner that we would do them for uh, uh, one-piece COZ. And reducing, uh, doing, doing all the bone work, um, and then starting again in this normal fashion, you know, both from medial to lateral and from lateral to medial. Identity only the vasculature this pretty significant involvement of the MCA branches here. And then peeling the lateral wall, the cavernous sinus, and uh, all the way up to the anterior petroclinal ligament. And then the reconstruction, try to um, do as good of a watertight closure as possible, along with um, fat. Um, that's a go-to reconstruction. And again, these are some of the cosmetic um, results that you can get. And uh, it is actually pretty hard to see um, that, of course, avoiding that altogether with an atraumatic transorbital uh, approach, that's all better. But I think that at least I am not as comfortable doing that some of the larger tumors. Um, this is an example of a transorbital meter for um, um, an encephalocele. Again, working with both our ANT surgeons as well as our oculoplastic surgeons to reduce it and put a mucosal graft, um, and that healed very nicely. Um, for vascular lesions, um, Dr. Um, uh, Maria Priselda uh, showed the variations of uh, the thalamic artery, um, the, both the transnasal route as well as the uh, lateral route are, are a good approach. Usually, obviously, these are 
lesions that are approached with a pipeline, et cetera, but they're obviously contraindications to many patients either because their inability to take um, anticoagulation and uh, antiplatelet medication um, and um, both the endonasal and the, uh, the lateral routes are viable alternatives depending on how medial um, the aneurysm is and how anterior it is, et cetera. It's actually um, a case that we did recently uh, of this um, cavernous sinus aneurysm presented with an ictus, uh, an almost complete si cavernous sinus syndrome, um, and they were unable to pass a pipeline through it. Uh, I was concerned about doing um, uh, a balloon test occlusion given how much um, thrombus there was already in the aneurysm and um, the fact that they couldn't go through. Um, so we decided to um, essentially bypass it and trap it and, and try also to decompress it by trapping it. Uh, but um, this would have to, uh, this would require actually getting access to um, the choroid artery proximal to the family artery to keep the family artery open. Of course, you can try and this, um, the majority of the times you can get away with uh, taking the family artery and could sequentially, uh, but uh, if you can save it, obviously that's all, always beneficial. I'm gonna go through um, this in, in too much detail, um, but we did radiograph and um, this is nicely flowing. So occluded at the neck, uh, but then, um, trying to get uh, access uh, proximal to the distal dual ring uh, here and sort of just dancing around the optic nerve to try and get access to the uh, clinal or segment of the choroid artery. It does require a little bit further um, dissection uh, deep into um, the dual rings and dissection of the ophthalmic artery here. But uh, eventually, uh, create enough of a dissection to be able to place a, a clip that was proximal to the ophthalmic. So this ophthalmic will uh, fill retrograde uh, from um, the bypass and uh, the patient did not have an ECOM, had a very small PCOM and then tied it at the neck um, and then tied the ophthalmic. I'll also perform a suction decompression here um, to decompress the cavernous sinus and um, occlude the aneurysm, but also um, thankfully try to oh, oh, preserve the ophthalmic artery filling here as well. Um, I do have time. Working across the optic nerves um, is a case uh, also relatively recently, um, but creating a corridor uh, by complete dissection of the um, cistern above the optics. Um, of the lamina terminalis uh, can give a nice corridor across to the contralateral cilia and fissure. There's a case of bilateral MCA aneurysm with a very short uh, contralateral um, M1 segment. Uh, here I had to do something that I never had to do before, which is sort of a contralateral anterocleinoidectomy um, that uh, was necessary to, you see the aneurysm, this is the left MCA will come from the right side approach. Uh, but it's hidden under the contralateral anteroclinoid. Perhaps, perhaps um, um, you know, know that's good of a planning and movement on my part, um, but um, performing contralateral anteroclinoidectomy here and uh, get a little bit better access to the aneurysm. Uh, this was medially pointing, so I uh, pre provide a little bit better access. Um, so it did require um, adjustment of the construct to try and get uh, the whole aneurysm. And then uh, finally tackling the ipsilateral aneurysm. And this is the final result. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit quickly. Sometimes more than one corridor is, uh, is better. Uh, this was a, a case of a, a central skull base calcified meningioma. Um, this is the one uh, that I, even though much of the pathology was ventral, uh, that I chose to go lateral first to decompress the nerve uh, through a, um, a pretty comprehensive anterocleinoidectomy and create kind of a, um, a corridor 
uh, and a landmark uh, to find in a bloody field um, that would decrease the blood loss before actually decompressing the nerve and then going into nasally uh, to decompress the nerve. Here, we're removing the optic struct from the other side. So, you know, a 360 decompression, uh, dancing again around the optic nerve and removing all the involved dura. Uh, here's the ophthalmic artery coming into view. So trimming uh, the distal dura ring up to the ophthalmic and the diaphragm cellae. So this is essentially um, a diaphragmatic meningioma that's secondarily calcified. You want to think about it like that. Um, Here's the final result. Still no Simpson grain one intersection, but it's as good as I, we could do. And um, we're able to um, improve her vision. So um, in conclusion, with ventral and lateral approaches uh, in, in trying to dance around the optic nerve um, are, 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 an essential, are essential parts of the toolbox. And um, one of the takeaway points, if nothing else, is that the epicenter of the tumor uh, probably is the single most important thing in dictating the best approach. Um, and when choosing a lateral approach, we obviously we have uh, many transorbital approaches that can be a powerful, minimally invasive um, alternative uh, to traditional lateral skull-based approaches. But we always have to be careful, as Dr. Mo has, um, has also shown, that uh, these approaches are not compromising uh, where we can achieve our instrumentation and uh, our visibility. So uh, I think we're not too far over time. Thanks, George. Thank you very much. I mean, you're a perfect example of uh, why skull-based surgeons should be tailors and not married to one specific technique and know how to juggle the different techniques. Uh, I think the audience, uh, I think, got that message uh, very clearly from your beautiful, even though they were choppy, the beautiful videos. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see. Um, any um uh george let's uh let's ask you nima uh, nima amini wants to ask you is it wise to drill out the optic canal for cases like anterior clinoidal meningiomas i'm not sure if he means you mean endonasally or i'm, I'm not sure what he means but uh is it yeah, no, yeah i mean go I, ahead anterior meningiomas are again uh tumors that are starting laterally to the optic nerve so I think tackling them endonasally, um, perhaps there's a, a role for them if you're just trying to create like a, um, a quote unquote less invasive option without creating a leak, et cetera. Uh, I don't think you can get too much out of it. Um, but uh, doing just a bone only decompression endonasally, uh, I don't think there's too much role, but tackling them certainly endonasally is the absolute wrong uh, corridor. When we, when I try to do uh, <laughs> meningiomas laterally, um, that yes, I try to drill the optic canal first and then go into nasally. I'm sorry, and then go um, open the dura and and um, and resect the tumor. I know that's debatable. Bill Coldwell always is um, wary about you know all the manipulation that you do, like when you do an anterocleinectomy first uh, and then decompress the tumor. But I think um, I think it's worthwhile, and obviously, not all every case is the same. Um, I don't know if I'm answering the question. I, th I think you are. Uh, Carolina, Dr. Benjamin, my partner, I don't know if she has any comments or questions to the panelists or you want anything, Carolina? You're muted. You're muted. You know, I was going to actually ask Chris the same thing about the reconstruction. Um, I saw that okay. you had one reconstruction of the inferior, right, In, of the inferior orbit. Um, is that something you do routinely? Um, of the inferior orbit, it just depends on how much bone is gone and how much of the periorbita um, is removed. If it's a significant amount, I, I certainly do. Uh, for smaller defects, I start with PDS sheet, uh, polydiaxonon, which is really an amazing uh, material because it's non-adhesive, 
Um, if I have uh, larger weight bearing uh, defects and I use a titanium sheet, but um, the other place I'll use a PDS sheet is an orbital re roof um, reconstruction, particularly if the um, levator or superior oblique are exposed because the, the PDS sheet uh, leaves behind a glide layer once it dissolves. And um, even if you have to go back in and uh, reoperate it, it's a very separable, easy to dissect plane. So um, yeah, it depends on the size of the defect and, and the location. It's a great, great question. Fantastic talks, both everybody. I have a question, uh, Dr. Mo, if, if there's none else. Go, go ahead, George. Chris, for, for the uh, sort of incisions within, uh, not externally, but you know, uh, the transcurrencular, et cetera, uh, and using the endoscope. What would you, you what would be, to, you, obviously you, you showed multiple indications, but in terms of tumors, what's the extent of that you would chase a tumor with, with an approach like that? Great question. And again, that's something that I'll, I'll do a vector mapping with at the beginning of the case. Um, and, um, you know, if it, it depends if there's any evidence of uh, extraocular muscle involvement, once the extraocular muscle involvement uh, occurs, then we're um, talking about uh, sacrificing um, the eye and doing a, an exoneration. Um, so um, for benign tumors, we'll do uh, ones that are uh, quite large. Um, for uh, anterior clinoid meninge and things like that, uh, often do a, a, a superior approach. So um, great question. It really depends on the location of the tumor and the extent, whether it's benign um, or, or malignant um, pushing <laughs> versus invading. Um, but whenever you can, uh, starting out with the vector analysis at the beginning is uh, very helpful. Great. Let me invite now uh, Matthew Sun, uh, our fellow to present a case for our two panelists. Okay, let me share my screen. And Chris, one quick thing. Do you, uh, do you use eyelid or eyebrow at this point? I'm not a fan of eyebrow. And the reason is because an eyelid incision will get you to the same place. You may need to extend it further laterally. But I talked to our residents about um, uh, coefficients of distension and axis of rotation of a flap. Um, fancy terms for, can you just make the incision a little bit bigger? I think incisions um, through or around the eyebrow are, are, are not attractive. I um, admittedly am also a facial plastic surgeon, so that's um, concerning to me. But there have been studies where uh, one of the most def defining features in recognizing somebody is their eyebrows. And it's definitely something we look at. And I think there are a lot of photographs. It's not too hard to photograph an eyebrow and make the incision look favorable, but I've sure seen a lot that don't look great. So um, super question. And I, um, most of those we can get through a, an upper eyelid crease uh, approach. Thank you. Okay, if uh, there are no more questions, I'll go ahead and present this case. Um, go ahead. So this is a 52-year-old male who eight years ago uh, at an outside hospital uh, was found to have proptosis and underwent subtotal resection of a tumor within the orbit and the pathology came back as solitary fibrous tumor. And unfortunately, his initial surgery eight years ago uh, left him blind um, because of uh, hematoma post-op. And um, he then now presents to our clinic uh, an oculoplastics clinic with uh, one month of progressive left eye proptosis and eye pain. So on exam, he has uh, no light perception in his left eye, but extraocular movements are otherwise intact. And I'll show you, this is the only imaging we have before his original surgery eight years ago. It's a CT scan. And uh, he had a transorbital approach initially eight years ago. It's unclear how much of the tumor they resected, but when he then came back to us, um, it's clear that now it's, it's even bigger than uh, the original tumor. 
and show you the uh, thinner cuts as well as the coronal. Going all the way back to the um, orbital apex. And the proptose is obvious even on the MRI scan. Here's the CT. You can see evidence of the transorbital approach they did before. Um, so the question for our, our speakers today, um, how, how would you treat this recurrent tumor now? Grace, you want to have a first dab at this? Sure. Um, what's the patient's goal? Is the patient's goal, goal to preserve the uh, uh, non-seeing globe? Um, does the patient have cosmetic concerns? What does the patient uh, say? The patient has a lot of pain, so he wants the pain to go away, and also the proptosis. Um, um, he wants that to be uh, resolved. So... Um, given that uh, setting, um, solitary, solitary fibrous tumors, obviously, as their term, can, can be quite fibrous and difficult to, to remove. If you do a monoportal approach, you're going to be doing a, a lot of tugging on it. Um, optic nerve is not an issue. Um, you do want to try to save the extraocular muscles. Um, so one possibility is to detach the extraocular muscles, have your oculoplastic surgeon do that and widen the approach. But I would start out probably um, by trying to pass it between the extraocular muscles if possible. So I would do a biportal approach. Um, I'd probably have to uh, look at the, the um, images a little uh, more closely, but I would do a uh, lateral transorbital approach and then a medial transorbital um, precoruncular slash uh, transnasal. And the reason is you want to be able to manipulate the, the tumor from both sides. When we're seeing people doing transnasal um, re resection of uh, orbital tumors, we aren't seeing the, the deep side of the tumor. We're not seeing the lateral side of the tumor. And so it's always scary to me because you don't know about the uh, vascular supply. So this is the type of thing where I think you want to do a um, kind of push-pull uh, technique. And um, a lot of it would also depend on the um, how fibrous the tumor is. And you may well have to uh, uh, change your plan or add a portal such as a superior portal. Um, but I think you have to be a little flexible based on what you see intraoperatively. I think you can uh, preserve the globe <clears throat> and I, can, I think you can preserve it as a, um, as a mobile structure for aesthetic reasons. George, how do you think, how do you guys do this in Pittsburgh? Yeah, again, I think I completely agree with uh, like Mo in terms of what the goals of surgery are. And uh, mm -hmm. the fact that the patient can't see already, I think there's a huge plus. I think um, you're working, again, I would probably 100% involve Tony Stefko in this or one of our other kilplastic surgeons. Uh, <clears throat> but I think, and, and, and again, studying the, images a little bit more in detail, but I think the main surgical corridor here is gonna be between the superior rectus and the lateral rectus. I think that's where it comes closer to a surface. So do an incision like an eyelid incision um, and uh, gaining that corridor, but then perhaps uh, extending more medially and creating another corridor medial to the superior rectus, um, as Dr. Mo said, to um, uh, try and sort of um, have a better, um, understanding and visibility of the medial aspect of the tumor as well um, and um, try and tackle it like that. Um, whether to detach the tumor uh, or not, or whether they detach the uh, extracular muscles or not, uh, I guess can be dictated, you know, intraoperatively uh, if you're having more trouble seeing. One uh, other consideration. Oh, sorry, George. Go ahead. Yes. Um, no, no, go ahead. Consideration. It looks like the orbital roof is distended superiorly. So it's actually possible to end up with enophthalmus after removing this. Um, <clears throat> unlikely, but it is a, <clears throat> a consideration. And if you're concerned about that, 
um, bringing down the orbital roof at the end of the case or actually removing the orbital roof to let the brain drop down uh, afterwards, let the frontal, lo frontal lobe take up some of that space um, may also be useful. And the way you gauge that is by doing Hertel's X ophthalmometry. And you can do that on the table um, at the beginning of the case and at the end. And the patient is going to have two millimeters of uh, further um, enophthalmus uh, at the end uh, after the uh, edema goes down. So in other words, um, you want to have mild proptosis at the end of this operation so that you um, end up uh, with symmetry. And if you have uh, symmetric lobes or enophthalmus, it's going to be worse afterwards. So uh, consider using uh, exophthalmometry perioperatively. Would you ever use fat um, intraop just to fix that as opposed to try and um, reconstruct the, uh, the, the roof, I guess? Uh, it's uh, certainly a possibility. Um, and uh, the thing is, though, I'd want to do that outside of the periorbita, if I could, to make sure you don't get inflammation to the uh, extraocular muscles. Okay, Matt. Um, so I think our panelists and our speakers uh, really brought up some really good points. Um, just kind of going over the treatment options. Obviously, surgical resection is the standard of care for solitary fibrous tumors. And, um, you know, we've already talked about different types of approaches mm -hmm. and, um, you know, multiportal approaches, um, combining endoscopic and nasal, even with transorbital approaches. And uh, obviously, um, craniotomy or craniorbital approach is, is one uh, option as well. Um, radiation is not really standard of care, but um, there's some case reports of, you know, you know these tumors responding to radiation, um, usually the really malignant ones. And this is probably not one of those. Uh, and then targeted therapies, uh, the efficacy is fairly limited. Um, there's some small series using anti-angiogenic therapy for uh, solitary fibrous tumors. And so what we did was, um, you know, uh, com uh, dual surgical team uh, combined with aquaplastics, we performed a uh, cranial orbital approach for this resection. We uh, unfortunately don't have the surgical video, but removed the orbital rim, removed the orbital roof and got wide exposure and um, resect the tumor and um, replace the orbital rim and part of the orbital roof back. And then um, uh, posteriorly and laterally uh, used a small piece of mesh to also reconstruct the orbital uh, roof uh, that was done by our actual plastics team. So interestingly, um, you know, um, postoperatively, there is actually a pretty significant residual uh, on the MRI. And, um, and as you can see here, patient um, still has a fair amount of proptosis as well. And um, our oculoplastics team also did fair, fair amount of resection. They also felt that you know um, a, a complete piece of tumor, which was very fibrous, very tough and adherent was respected. And it, it was, as you can see, even on the pre-op MRI, there's some subtations on the contrast and T2 sequencing sequence uh, imaging. So perhaps there were two separate lobules of this tumor that, you know, one of them was resected. Um, here's the uh, coronal and sagittal of the residual. And so at this point, I um, was wondering what the, for the panelists, um, what would you do at this point? Um, I think uh, similar type situation, I think the value of uh, a transorbital endoscopic approach is <clears throat> that you can make a very uh, significant orbital ca uh, optical cavity, so you can really explore nicely. Um, and you can explore uh, essentially um, globally. So um, again, it's, um, you know, you guys did a beautiful job and it's, uh, you don't wanna, um, critique other surgeons because it's uh, hard to be in the situation that they were in. But the other thing you might think about is if you were able to find it, what, what kind of instrumentation you use to remove it. So um, for example, re radio frequency aspirators um, are sometimes helpful in more fibrous tumors. Sometimes you need to try different um, instrumentations, uh, instrumentation to, to remove it. But if the patient's happy, maybe, maybe you're good the way it is. George? Yeah, perhaps nothing. Actually, the the way if you go back with the coronal, I think most of it is actually coming in, 
inferiorly immediately. So considering uh, like a, perhaps an endonasal cord is also an option here. Uh, but again, it's all, it all comes down to where the goals are and the patient is willing to go yet one more surgery or, or not. Um, you could potentially even just decompress it, take down the uh, lamina transnasally and uh, take down the orbital floor uh, transnasal tr uh, transmaxillary. Um, and that may uh, provide you some more room. You know, it is, uh, as Chris, as you said, it's a matter of getting the best visualization intra-op and whether you use the microscope or the endoscope. And, you know, that, that probably would have prevented this residual from being uh, left there. But uh, um, Matt, do you want to carry Yeah, on? so we actually talked to the patient and you know he still felt that he wanted his proptosis to get even better. Um, so after a discussion with the patient, we took the patient um, back to the OR. Um, we ended up uh, opening up the original incision, uh, sorry, the, our, our, our first stage incision and uh, basically did a redo cranial orbital approach for the resection. And this time, you know, we were fairly aggressive, you know, under the microscope. Um, first really went as posteriorly as possible, um, try to dissect the lesion, trying to find the border, although it was very stuck, um, you know, particularly at the orbital apex to the um, different muscle tendons. But um, we um, were able to get a kind of a near, total resection, but there's still a little bit of residual you can see here post-op. Very nice result, looks quite a bit better. Yeah, the key, you know, and the reason we brought this case in, Chris, is, you know, I mean, you know more than me, there are many in the oculoplastic field who actually don't use a microscope or, or an endoscope for that matter. And I, you know, it's interesting, many of neurosurgical instrumentation and visualization, a lot of it, we learned it from ophthalmologists and to see some, you know what I'm saying? Some sometimes uh, interesting, the training, I guess, in oculoplastic doesn't always include microscope. Is that, well, is that <clears throat> an exception? Yeah, I agree. And, and that, that was one of the points I was trying to make with a slide showing the benefits of uh, orbital endoscopy in terms of where it places the lighting and it changes the shape of the optical cavity. You need less retraction. But the other thing is adding navigation. So um, one of the uh, ways you might have found more residual tumor at the very beginning in the first case is if uh, is by doing navigation and seeing uh, that you've actually opened up all the areas where the uh, tumor exists. So um, I'm a heavy user. Also I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. But uh, the ultrasound also is a valuable um, adjunct for the orbit. I think you have a very good window uh, to be able to see particularly the larger lesions. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, Eva, can we, Matt, can we we'll go to Eva now? And by the way, one somebody in the audience asked whether stereotactic radiation is an option here. It, it's really not <clears throat> for this type of pathology. Go ahead, Eva. Okay, so this case is also called uh, solitary fibrous tumor. So it's a 59-year-old male who initially presented to another hospital back in 2014 because every time he would blow his nose, uh, he would have periorbital bruising. And this also occurred when he would bend down or exert himself. And so they thought it was some kind of vascular lesion. And so they got an MRI the MRI is shown here on the right, and this was back in September of 2014. And so then because they thought it was some kind of vascular lesion, they actually ended up treating him with bleomycin sclerotherapy at this outside hospital. So then after this, um, he presented again later on with worsening proptosis and diplopia. So now they got another MRI, which shows that this lesion had now increased in size. And so this is in uh, June of 2016, which is two year, about a year and a half later. And so then they under they uh, did a transconjunctival uh, orbitotomy and did a biopsy um, at that outside hospital. And they actually stopped the biopsy early because they got a lot of bleeding. 
And so the pathology was inconclusive. And so now a few months later, he had even worsening symptoms. And so they got an MRI, which is here shown on the right side. Um, and then the old MRI was on, is on the left. And it seems like the lesion's even slightly bigger now. And so now again at the same hospital, they did an orbitotomy via a Lynch incision to try to biopsy the lesion. And now this pathology at that time showed a cellular solitary fibrous tumor with mild to moderate atypia. So then now they sent the patient to us um, for evaluation and here's his MRI on the right side. And at that time when he presented to us, he had proptosis, uh, hypoglobus and wasn't able to adduct um, his eye. And so we wanted to ask the panelists, you know, how would they manage this patient at this time? How's the visual acuity? So they actually, you know, this was back in 2017. It wasn't really documented, but based on the, the only ophthalmology note that we had was that he didn't have any kind of like compressive optic neuropathy. They didn't have a visual acuity documented for some reason. George, what, you want to go first? Yeah. So what uh, what was the incision? It was a Lynch incision that was used. Um, yeah. I think this is still sort of the optimal trajectory. Um, to Dr. Mo's point here, I think potentially uh, trying to expand that. Obviously, that's going to be a bloody tumor. Trying to expand that to have like a uh, multiple trajectories uh, to it, um, potentially even with a, like an intranasal corridor as well. Uh, so compare combining the two, um, I think having um, sort of non-stick bipolars and the microscope and, um, and having potentially um, the endoscope available from both uh, portals and um, uh, as well as uh, um, ultrasound potentially, I think that's going to be uh, key here. Um, but I think you know, with the progression and, and the symptoms, I think the, you know, it's, it's warranting resection. Yeah, those are great points. Um, this is not behaving like a typical solitary fibrous adenoma, uh, fibrous adenoma. Um, and um, you, you wonder um, how accurate that was. And then that also starts to bring in a role for potential post-operative uh, radiation. Um, I don't know, um, you know, what the status of the optic nerve is. Um, uh, these days we'd get OCT and, and try to see if there were any early uh, changes. Um, the fact that the patient had some weakness on um, uh, abduction wonders if, it makes you wonder if the um, uh, orbital apex is uh, starting to become involved more, more deeply beyond what you're seeing. Um, I agree completely with George that um, um, an anterior approach is a good idea, but also um, I would start transnasally um, and um, I would want to decompress the lamina so that you could um, uh, have a little more room for, for when you're working on the tumor. I would also try to find the um, ethmoid arteries and I would try to um, um, uh, coagulate them early on because that's the only uh, chance of reducing um, the, the bleeding that you're going to uh, uh, encounter. <clears throat> a superior eyelid approach would be very nice because you could um, start outside of the tumor um, above under the uh, periorbita and um, you could sneak media, uh, medially and see the um, ethmoid arteries uh, from above and ligate them. You could go back and see the optic nerve and, and see how the pathology is, is behaving there. And then, um, then again, a multiportal uh, approach is gonna be very useful. A Lynch incision in general, um, I'm not a big fan of because it puts you medial to the lamina. So the vector is off. Um, I, I would um, think about doing a um, trans uh, conjunctival approach, um, precuruncular, transcuruncular, and um, and moving uh, backwards from there. There's uh, no question you, you definitely want to work with your um, uh, extra with with your oculoplastic surgeon, and maybe this is where the uh, 
uh, chat GPT was correct that we really need to uh, learn to communicate with, with them at the beginning of the case before before the case. Okay, Eva. So we ended up doing a terional crany with a uh, superorbital craniotomy and then uh, superior orbitotomy. So we took off the roof of the orbit. And so oculoplastics, after we got them the exposure, oculoplastics went in and they were able to get all of the uh, intraorbital lesion. And so now this time the pathology actually came back as a malignant solitary fibrous tumor. And now the KI-67 was 10%. <laughs> and there were seven mitotic figures per um, high power field. And so, you know, now we followed the patient. And so this is three years after his um, surgery by us. And so in May of 2020, he actually presented again with one month of flashing lights in his right eye. And so at this time, his visual acuity was actually 2030 in the right eye. And then he had baseline diplopia with far right lateral gaze. And so now we wanna see you know, how the panelists would manage the patient now. Yeah, and anything different from, well, first of all, Chris, you obviously recognize that this was not a typical uh, course. A anything you would say different than you've said before, both of you for this second recurrence? I would have, I would have radiated the patient. I would have given a significant thought to radiating uh, this after first with probably with the proton uh, beam radiation. Now, having said that, um, the, the patient will get cataracts from the radiation and um, the patient may preserve the eye, but um, they often become quite tender. Uh, painful and may end up having exoneration later. So, so not proceeding with radiation was perfectly reasonable. Um, but I think you guys did a, a a brilliant job with this. Just for the sake of time, go ahead, uh, Eva. So now this time we ended up doing an endoscopic transorbital um, approach for a section with our ENT colleagues as well as oculoplastics team. Um, here's the post-op MRI from one month post-op and it uh, was gross total resection at that time. And so now actually the pathology was, you know, even worse. It was high grade hemangioparasitoma, who grade three, KI-67 was now 30% and uh, greater than 20 mitosis per uh, high power field. Would you do anything differently that you, you know, mentioned? No, good. Okay. No, go ahead. I mean, I guess the radiation, obviously. Yeah. Right. I was going to say, at this point, I think you yeah. sort of have more ammunition to be aggressive. Yeah. yeah. But the thing, the, the question then also becomes, you're going to radiate this eye. Um, as I mentioned, there's a very high uh, chance a patient's going to have a painful, uh, use, not useful eye. And so I would have a serious discussion with the team about exoneration at this point, um, both because uh, there's a good chance that you know what's going to happen in the future and also because you may improve the uh, efficacy of uh, radiation. This patient has a life-threatening tumor at this point, and so you, um, you need to change your tactics just a little bit in your thinking, I think. Yes, we ended up radiating this patient, and so this is the MRI mm -hmm one and a half years post-op and three months after the photon beam. And so then, you know, at one and a half, uh, one and a half years after radiation and two years post-op, now this MRI in June of 2022 shows that he has recurrence again in the right orbit and it's now spread to the right cavernous sinus. And so here um, we ended up doing uh, radiation just to the cavernous sinus part because he had already received the max amount of radiation to the orbit. And so then, you know, after that um, photon beam radiation in October of 2022, we had another MRI, which shows that the cavernous sinus lesion was stable, but the right side lesion was even bigger. So is this, Chris and George, is this, I mean, you know, we're obviously losing the battle. Is this is there any point in being super aggressive and doing a complete exenteration and cavernous, you know, I've done a number of cavern, surgical cavernous sinus exenterations, or is that too aggressive? Um, I think it, it's obviously worth it discussing a tumor board, doing like a PET scan, making sure there's no other fossae, and then doing like right. a... Detail, the MRI, make sure I understand 
where in the cavernous sinus it is, et cetera. And then if it's just localized, doing a balloon test occlusion now, if he fails a balloon test occlusion, whether you go away, bypass and all that, I, I think that's been proven not to be um, helpful in most times, but I'm not sure that um, we have the number needed to treat for this. So that's something that's worth discussing, I think, but with the understanding that that will be sort of a heroic measure. I don't know if yeah. Dr. Shaker or Wash U, uh, I'm sorry, uh, UW is, is still doing that, but obviously one of the most um, not, not so not so many cavern, radical cavernous sinus re resections, but um, you know I think the writing's on the wall. The patient will most like will possibly have a palliative exoneration in the in the future, but I think the patient's no longer uh, curative based on this. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, I, I am mindful of the time. It's seven p.m., and I don't want to keep us uh, all very late. Any any last minute comments or um, questions between the panelists? Anybody? I think we covered more most of the audience questions. It's been a fantastic session. Uh, um, I'm sorry, Maria couldn't be with us after her masterful anatomical presentation. Chris, we're mindful that you need to hit the slopes uh, either now or later <laughs> or tomorrow. <laughs> thank you for sharing this time with us. George, thank you. Great seeing you both uh, last week in Tampa at the NASBS. To the audience, uh, have a good night. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.